Hello, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Chiara Benetti, and on behalf of ETA Florence Renewable Energies, technical organizer of today's event, I welcome you to IA by Energy webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Residential Wood Combustion Towards Low Emission Systems. The webinar will be moderated by Martin Tony Hansen, Senior Consultant, Lead of Task 32 on Biomass Combustion, EA Energy Analysis from Denmark. It will be presented by Professor Dr. Thomas Nussbaumer, Verenum Research, uh, Zurich, Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Swiss Federal Office of Energy and Delegate of IA by Energy Task 32 from Switzerland. It will be also presented by Morten Gottlieb Warming Jespersen, Head of Section Energy and Climate from the Danish Technological Institute. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Gabriel Reichert, Senior Researcher, Emission Technology and Research, uh, Direct Heat and Systems, Bioenergy and Sustainable Technologies from Austria. Uh, during the webinar, you will have the opportunity to drop questions by using the Q&A tab that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the speakers will reply to your questions um, at the end of the presentations or by typing the um, replies directly in the Q&A tab. Uh, please do not use the chat box for questions, but do use only the Q&A tab. Um, the webinar will be recorded and the presentations and the recording will be available from tomorrow on on IA by Energy website in the section events webinars. Um, from my side, that's all. So um, have a good, uh, good webinar and I leave the floor to the moderator, Mr. Hansen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara. Uh, I also want to wish everyone a very welcome. Uh, to this excited, exciting uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm very excited to see uh, so many participants <clears throat> that have uh, found their way to the screen and headsets to follow this uh, webinar on residential wood uh, combustion. I think I have already been introduced by uh, Chiara. Uh, I will try to moderate the session um, and um, I will just talk briefly about task 32 to give you an impression in case you should not already know. Um, task uh, 32 biomass combustion belongs to the subgroup of uh, uh, IEA uh, bioenergy, that is a so-called TCP, uh, Technology Collaboration Program under the International Energy Agency. In uh, task 32, uh, member countries, currently nine member countries, uh, collaborate uh, on gathering, digesting, and disseminating knowledge about combustion of solid biomass for energy generation, uh, of the consequences and of the potential improvements that can be made. Um, countries are Austria, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland currently, uh, who form task 32. But the task is very open for more members that wish to contribute uh, to the work and or benefit uh, from the specialized knowledge that we have uh, gathered here. So the main idea of task 32 is to share recent uh, experiences and knowledge open-mindedly in order to assist each other in uh, moving forward while not uh, repeating mistakes that have been made uh, shortly. Um, task 32 engages with the biomass combustion in all sizes of plants from the smallest small stoves to the largest uh, power plants that you can imagine. And today we'll focus on the small scale. Uh, the focus is on how to reduce emissions from small scale uh, wood combustion while maintaining the benefits of heating homes with the local renewable energy and resources and thus contributing to a, a green uh, transition and replacing uh, heating uh, that is done by fossil fuels. Uh, the webinar will pre present the most recent findings from ongoing work within the task, uh, task 32, uh, on design guidelines uh, for stoves and uh, real life test methods. Uh, I have to mention that we plan to, to uh, publish the full reports in the coming month or so. 
they are in the final editing. Um, and then, as uh, Kiara just mentioned, we will uh, have a Q&A session after three, the three uh, presentations. So to the first presentation, uh, it is a general introduction uh, to biomass combustion and uh, pollutant reduction in wood stoves and boilers. And it aims to set up the scene, so to speak. It will be given by Professor Dr. Thomas Nussbaumer, who is uh, the owner of Fair Random Research and uh, professor at the, the Technical University of Return in Switzerland. Thomas has specialized in uh, sciences on pollutant formation and emission reduction in biomass combustion with a special focus on NOx and particulate uh, matter. Um, and Thomas is also the Swiss representative uh, in task 32. So uh, please, Thomas, the floor is yours or the microphone is yours. And I think you will have to share your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction and for the invitation to give this introduction to biomass combustion and pollutant reduction in wood stoves and boilers. So I'm happy to give this presentation. I prepared roughly 25 minutes as introduction and uh, would like to start with a very brief introduction on the role, on the role of bioenergy. Okay, now I'm ready. On the role of bioenergy, um, with respect to the world energy supply and also its contribution to climate change, the positive effect and the disadvantage which is air pollution. So first of all, the contribution of biomass today here um, summarized as biofuels and waste is roughly nine or nearly 10% share of the total energy today. And of course, Thomas, do you have the slides? Yes. Okay. You don't. You do not see the slides. I don't see the slides. No. I have it here. That's better. Now you see the slides. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm very Thank sorry. You. I thought it were, they were already there. They are now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Here we are. So. Um, the role of bioenergy, energy supply and climate change, the positive effect, um, biofuels and waste here in the statistics of the IEA contributes to 9.1% of the world's energy uh, supply. And I have actually, let's say for the future, two facts or more my personal hypothesis. So first of all, I believe that solar energy has the largest potential which uh, we need to exhaust in future. And if we do so, uh, this will cause a huge demand on energy storage. And my second fact is that actually wood is renewable and net CO2 free if it, uh, it comes from sustainable forestry. So I of course assume for sustainable forestry. And then I think that it can ideally complement solar energy as main renewable energy in the future as a storable fuel also for seasonal storage in winter. So in winter, it can contribute to heating uh, all, day long, uh, all the year. It can contribute to electricity and process heat in large scale. Today, we're talking about small scale where it contributes to heating. And we have a potential target conflict, basically the carbon which uh, comes basically fixed carbon from photosynthesis. So it is stored solar energy. This carbon shall be converted completely to CO2. If this uh, works, uh, we have a closed carbon cycle. If we somewhere stay between carbon and CO2, we also have some negative effects as for instance, um, carbonaceous material in the form of soot and other pollutants, which needs to be absolutely uh, avoid it, which can be avoided. If we do not avoid it, we see that it can have very significant negative health effects. So uh, if you look at this data on uh, deaths rate per year, uh, we see that by 2030, smoke from biomass 
will be the death uh, reason number one, which is not the natural reason. Um, now, this is not really biomass combustion in technical um, devices only, but it is mainly, of course, also in very simple devices for cooking, as shown here. But nevertheless, we need to um, consider that if a part of this is coming from wood combustion in stoves and boilers, this needs to be reduced. So this is the target, actually, of my presentation also, to start with pollutant formation, focus on particulate matter and organic compounds, and derive actually consequences on how to reduce to really have a closed cycle, really converting all the carbon to CO2. If we do so, there is also some mineral matter in the ash, which theoretically can be recycled. Now, I will not talk about the ash recycling today because there are also some limitations, but we have to consider that there is potassium, chlorine, nitrogen also available in wood as fuel. So if we want to convert this carbon to CO2, it will not always um, result completely in a complete combustion to CO2 if we, this is not the case. There might be carbon monoxide as an intermediate uh, product. There might also be volatile organic compounds and there might also be carbon compounds which are in the particulate phase, solid phase, like soup, elemental carbon, or organic carbon, uh, primary organic aerosol. So this is what we need to avoid by uh, near complete combustion. If we do not avoid this, we have primary organic aerosol uh, contributing to PM10, particulate matter 10, smaller 10 microns in the atmosphere. We have secondary organic aerosol. This is uh, what we need to avoid. In addition, since there is also uh, some potassium and chloride in the fuel, this may result in potassium chloride as salt particle in the fuel. Um, this might also result, if we look at this nitrogen content in the fuel, in partly forming NO, and NOx emissions might be found in the atmosphere. So this is what we actually need to avoid. And if I want to focus in more detail in this particular matter, I have a very complex graph on the next slide. So um, don't worry, I will not go into detail here, but I would like to point out that we have on the one hand here in the left side, solid particulate matter. I was talking and introducing these salts coming from ash constituents uh, found here. So this is not 100% inavoidable as it is not inavoidable at high temperatures there is usually or very often actually the situation that we want to precipitate these from the flue gas, for instance, in electrostatic precipitator. This can be easily done if we only have salt particles. However, if there are also products from incomplete combustion here um, available in the flue gas, we have the problem this these products from incomplete combustion may also result in problems within precipitators. And if they are not precipitated, of course, everything uh, results in the atmosphere finally. In the atmosphere, we have the soot particles, uh, so solid particles. There are also droplets, I call this condensable organic compounds, COC, which is also known as tar. So these are large molecules which are formed actually um, as intermediate products in the decomposition process of wood. And if these decomposition products are not completely converted to CO2, they result as large molecules in the flue gas, and these large molecules may condensate to droplets in the atmosphere. Uh, in addition, I also introduced these gas phase pollutants uh, uh, previously already. So if we now try to look at what can happen in the combustion, uh, I introduce here carbon monoxide um, as an indicator for the incompleteness of combustion. So of course, we would like to go to zero or close to zero in a near complete combustion in a technical device. And if we want to do this, we need, of course, oxygen, but uh, at the theoretical stoichiometric available oxygen at excess air ratio one, where there's one 
oxygen molecule per carbon uh, atom, uh, we would realize that there will be lack of oxygen at certain um, locations in the combustion chamber. So at this stoichiometric ratio, a near complete combustion is not possible, except if you use catalyst, for instance. So if this is not the case, we will have high carbon monoxide emissions. Also, if we go to uh, values just slightly larger than one, uh, because we will always result in local lack of oxygen. In such local lack of oxygen zones at high temperature, also carbon uh, compounds may actually uh, agglomerate and form new products uh, by a synthesis. And this product is well known as soot, which we also find in diesel engines, but also in a wood combustion device. So this has to be actually avoided uh, by introducing uh, more oxygen than actually theoretically needed and having a good mixture between the gas and the oxygen or the air. If this is uh, achieved, we have near complete combustion. For instance, in this example, for a two stove, two stage log wood boiler at an excess air ratio of 1.5. Um, if we further introduce the excess air ratio, for instance, double to an excess air ratio of three, uh, we have to consider that by adding twice as much air as needed, we will have a significant dilution with inert material in the combustion chamber, which means that the average flame temperature will reduce. And if the average, average flame temperature is decreasing, the reaction rate is reduced, the reactions become slower, and hence we will also find increased CO emissions, for instance, at this point here, um, which will also result again in soot potentially. And in addition, if you have the conversion of the wood at relatively low temperature, these intermediate products, I mentioned already molecules, which are formed from the decomposition of wood, will then also be found in the flue gas and may condense to droplets in the tar phase, so carb, um, condensable organic compounds. So all these type of particles need to be reduced, basically salts often only from the flue gas by precipitation, while these need to be avoided by near complete combustion. If you see where the sources are coming from, uh, actually an automatic wood boiler, which has primary air for the gasification of the wood through the grate, which has secondary air, which is injected at high uh, velocity, which has high turbulence, good mixing, and then near complete combustion in a high temperature combustion chamber. This will basically only result in salts, just this very minor concentration of incompletely combusted carbon uh, particles and gases. Uh, on the other hand, if we go to a simple combustion as shown here in a simple wood stove, uh, this might result in moderate emissions if we do everything properly. If just one uh, parameter is not optimized, like for instance using wet wood or uh, closing the air inlet too early, or uh, any other reason, this might result in excessive uh, carbon formation, carbon emissions in the form of soot, COC, and volatile organic compounds. So this needs to be reduced. If we do everything right in such a wood stove, this can be done at stationary uh, conditions if the stove has its uh, high temperature, its operation temperature, and if we adjust the right excuse me, the right excess air ratio, et cetera. However, during the start, the combustion chamber is typically not yet at its operation temperature. Hence, during start, we have to accept slightly increased emissions, but maybe only for 10 or 15 minutes, but not for one hour, for example. So uh, if it has a bad start, this can be even more um, increased the carbon monoxide emissions and also the particulate matter emissions, and the start can also uh, last longer. So this also needs to be avoided by a good start, which ends up with some 
emissions, but then we go to slow, uh, low emissions during the stationary phase. And here we also see that this particle uh, characteristics also change during uh, these batch processes. Um, if we look at now also uh, actually the characteristics of this tip, different particle types, we actually would uh, expect that salt particles, potassium chloride, for instance, may have certain um, toxicity, but basically not high toxicity if once it is found in our body. So um, we did some investigations on the toxicity, cell toxicity, and we found that these um, uh, salt particles did not have a significant effect on the cell survival rate. On the other hand, if we introduce a uh, soot in the medium, we see that for soot, we have a significant toxicity. Nevertheless, this is now diesel soot. We even have a higher toxicity if we have organic material from incomplete combustion, such as these uh, tar droplets. So this is then really high toxicity. So we have basically to avoid uh, tar, we have to avoid soot. We cannot completely avoid salts, but this is in smaller concentration of, uh, uh, of high toxicity and higher concentrations in automatic boiler. It needs to be precipitated. So this is the influence of the operation. Uh, we have a very good operation. We have all the salts at very bad operations. We also found soot and tar in the flue gas. On the right-hand side, we also see that there is an influence, of course, of the technology. Uh, summarized, you can say that in automatic combustion, it is easier to achieve high temperature, good conditions for the whole um, time of um, operation. So this leads me actually to topic three, which measures can we take for residential wood combustion? And first, I would like to introduce the primary measure. And if we have a simple combustion device, let's say a wood stove, we have to uh, accept that we have something which resembles a diffusion flame. In a diffusion flame, the um, air or the oxygen available in the air is transported to the combustible gases by uh, diffusion. So there might be a reaction here in this uh, actually exchange area where air and gas um, have actually an exchange uh, surface. On the other hand, in the middle of the flame, there is no oxygen available, hence carbonaceous material is heated up and can then uh, actually go into synthesis reaction. The synthesis reaction may form soot, which is then available in the flame and which finally needs to be combusted when it uh, is mixed with oxygen. But this will not be completely uh, in such a diffusion flame, so there will be soot available at the end. Nevertheless, what can be done to avoid excessive soot? We have to avoid what I show here, cooling the flame by quenching, and we have to add a sufficient amount of air, but we see it will not be possible to have zero CO emissions in such a simple one-stage combustion, as I call it. We have limiting factors with air distribution, mixing, air tightness, heat release is desired, which reduces the flame temperature, etc. And the main issue is we need to avoid flame quenching, which then leads to um, excessive uh, particle emissions. Avoid quenching means we should introduce a hot combustion chamber. Uh, if we even have mixing here by such a redirection of the flue gases, this will improve the combustion, but it will add pressure drop. So these are main measures which we can do in a simple stove, but additionally and mandatory, we have to really go for an appropriate ideal startup. And the startup means for such updraft, um, small scale uh, stoves that usually we should avoid a huge uh, flame in such a small combustion chamber. We should start up the fire from top with some small um, pieces of wood which start, it start the fire. And this uh, may help to reduce actually the total emissions during one batch by a factor of two to three, as we see from different investigations uh, from a group from 
my group on the left from the group from Germany represented in the IEA on the right, which says a clear indication on how to improve the operation and the startup of such stoves. Uh, in addition, of course, this is well known, we should have an appropriate moisture content, so don't, so don't use wet wood in the stove. We, so, we should apply an appropriate log size also here, some investigations from my colleagues in Germany. Now, this was for wood stoves. If you go to wood boiler, um, we would actually really rather like to improve the combustion and move forward from uh, uh, excuse me, move forward from such a diffusion flame, rather go to something which resembles a premix flame. In a premix flame, we add oxygen, mix it with uh, the fuel prior to ignition. So once we ignite, there is oxygen available uh, in the vicinity of each combustible molecule. So if we ignite it here, it will burn rapidly and uh, there will be no chance for a synthesis reaction forming soot. And if this uh, happens, we also will actually find that the temperature rises to a far higher level, which means that also the reactions are faster and actually at the end in the flue gas, we will have nearly zero carbon monoxide and VOC emissions. So this is what we aim at. We cannot achieve this in a log wood boiler, but we can go towards such a uh, pre-mixing combustion. And the way to do this is that actually there is primary air uh, made available for a gasification of the uh, wood in a hot zone of maybe 800 degree C. And then combustible gases are released, which might be mixed with secondary air, so high turbulence for good mixing. Make, uh, if the excess air ratio is low, we have high temperature in the flame. We need a residence time of 0 0.2, temperature of 800 degree. And then we can afterwards just have the heat uh, exchange from the flue gas, which enables us with this uh, type to have basically all carbon converted to CO2 having near complete combustion. So this, what I show here is state of the art in Lockwood boilers. And logwood boilers are typically equipped with uh, ventilator, mechanical, um, uh, actually uh, the air is mechanically fed into the boiler with primary air and secondary air. Typically there is a fan also for the flue gas, but this enables high pressure drop and good mixing and hence also high combustion quality. Now, this is more or less state of the art, we can say we have to actually apply a heat storage tank to make sure that we should not actually reduce uh, the combustion rate once the boiler is in operation. For stoves, this can also be applied. I show here three prototypes or well, some of them are also commercially available from wood stoves, which also introduce such a two-stage combustion. So this is theoretically possible. However, we have typically limitations uh, that not in all cases fans are used. And in addition, we have typically also the situation that we want to see the flame and we have further limitations. So it's not the same uh, technology we can apply as in boilers, but we can go towards improved combustion also aiming at a certain kind of two-stage combustion. Um, we can clearly see that in the last 40, 50 years, uh, significant improvements were made, both, were made, both with boilers here on the left-hand side from uh, Austria reported, where we are now on far lower levels of um, emissions than 30, 40 years ago. And the same is true for stoves here in the right-hand side shown from Germany for carbon monoxide and also for particulate matter emissions, which may really result today in low levels of emissions. So uh, this will also be shown in the next presentation, approach technical guidelines. Uh, so real improvements were achieved. However, there is one important issue. This is the gap between theoretically possible values, type, uh, results on type test and reality. I show here uh, results from an investigation in Germany 
where they found that uh, the PM emissions in real measurements by chimney sweepers, um, uh, they showed these as function of the PMs reported from type test and their conclusion here was quite tough. There is no correlation. So this means there is a big gap that uh, in many cases, the real life emissions are significantly higher than on type test. So this is actually a remaining challenge I am convinced of. And to overcome this remaining challenge, there is another approach which will be presented in the presentation three today, is that we should also in testing go to uh, real life test methods to improve that in future will improve the technologies also that we have good results in the real life conditions. So these were my actually information on primary measures. Now, very briefly, secondary measures can be used as um, add-on, as additional measures. So catalysts can be introduced to uh, convert part of the oxidizable carbon in the flue gas. Inserts can improve the mixing or also additionally have a certain catalytic effect. Electrostatic precipitator can be used to uh, precipitate the particulate matter from the flue gas, which works very well for salt particles, which can uh, be critical, however, if we have a uh, combustible oxidizable carbon in the flue gas. Nevertheless, everything is available. I would just like to mention there are limiting effects during cold start. Uh, we have to make sure that if we have ESP, we have high availability, etc. There may be also some side effects like re-entrainment of soot, so soot should be avoided by primary measures. Secondary measure can complement but not replace primary measures. Yes, consequences for low emissions, appropriate ignition and startup, appropriate fuel, technology with two-stage combustion, options for stuff with ventilator, inserts for mixing, combustion control is always uh, important. Optionally, secondary measure, ESP is monitoring for boilers, heat storage tank is needed. So actually the remaining challenge is really somehow the cold start, which should be short and optimized. The ambient condition, if in particular, if you have natural draft for stoves. And last but not least, the operator influence. So the requirements for low emissions can be achieved. They are valid for all combustion type, but for automatic combustion type, they can be safely applied, safely achieved. Um, for manual devices, it remains highly challenging, mostly in, important in real life. So we see here another uh, results from Germany that if you go to real life emission, 64% of the pellet boilers meet the emission limit values also in practice, but for uh, the manual boilers, it's only 25. So here we have this gap, which I mentioned between type test and reality, which needs to be overcome. This leads me to the conclusions. So first, residential wood combustion uh, contributes to particulate matter and organic carbon, hence the emissions need to be reduced. Primary measures are combustion design, ideal startup, appropriate fuel, ideal operation. The technology has been improved by thermal insulation, air tightness, secondary air or combustion chamber. Modern devices achieve low emissions, certainly on test bench. Uh, secondary measures can further reduce emissions, but not replace primary measures. The main reason for remaining high impact locally in certain uh, places is the gap between test bench and non-ideal operation in real life. So this needs to be improved. Control systems can help. Monitoring can help to improve real life emissions. Uh, and also information and inspections certainly remain necessary. So these are my conclusions to this topic and I thank you very much for your uh, attention and I'm happy to hear the other presentations and be open for questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thomas. <clears throat> that was uh, very informative. I like your drawing along the right line, it really helps. Thank you very much.
Uh, I can see that there are some uh, questions and perhaps uh, you have the option of uh, taking a, a look at them uh, in the next uh, in the next session. Thank you again. And uh, on to the second presentation. In the second presentation, we will hear uh, Morten uh, Gottlieb, Barming Jespersen, uh, explain how specific design uh, in the combustion zones inside stoves can help reduce emissions uh, generated from, from, uh, from logwood combustion. Morten is a Master of Science in Energy Engineering and is employed with the Danish Technological Institute uh, in Denmark, where he's head of section in combustion and emissions technology, or at least until recently he was. Morten and his uh, colleagues uh, uh, are, the, are the main authors of the upcoming technical guidelines for the design of low emission stoves that uh, Task 32 will publish uh, in the near future. Morten, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, great, thank you. I'll just share my screen here. Uh, I hope it's visible for everybody. It is. Let's hope it is, perfect. I okay. Everybody, but yes. No, but you can see it, Morten, and yes, I yes. think the rest can as well. Okay, yeah, but my name is Morten Warming Jespersen. I'm from Danish Technological Institute. Uh, we are a research and test uh, organization, so we are a little bit in both worlds, uh, and we have had the task of uh, developing these technical uh, guidelines for uh, low emission stoves, and we have prepared these for uh, IEA bioenergy. Um, so we heard from Thomas uh, about uh, all of these effects that are coming from, from residential combustion. And so this is one of the reasons why we are introducing some guidelines. It, it is not to, there are of course always the best in class, the, the manufacturers who are really uh, developing uh, good uh, products that are uh, at the very, very low end of emissions from wood combustion. Um, but in general, we want to lift the entire uh, manufacturers all over Europe um, and all over the world uh, in order to be able to reduce the emissions in general for wood stoves. Um, then there's also the part about that there has over the last decades been a lot of research been done in Europe. Um, and we want to share this knowledge in a combined form. It has been very fragmented and we want to uh, introduce that into one uh, report where all can be uh, found from. And then we want to introduce the idea of having a balance between the design and the combustion. So of course, there's the need for design for the product. It has to stay in people's living rooms, but also that we have a lot of consideration into can we do the design a little bit different because we can achieve much better uh, combustion. So the uh, emissions that we are uh, reducing or focusing on reducing in, in this technical guidelines are the particles ranging from the coarse particles to the fine particles into the ultra fine particles. It's also the black carbon coming from uh, these uh, these wood stoves, it's the uh, VOCs and it's the CO that we are focusing on uh, mainly in this, uh, in this technical guideline. The guideline itself is, a, is a, a simple reading. It's not a research reading, it's uh, for technical uh, staff at the different manufacturers levels. So as Thomas said, there are different measures on how to reduce the emissions. And the clear goal is to start by reducing uh, the emissions by introducing primary measures first. So making sure that the emissions does not come out of the wood stove itself, or at least that they are as low as possible. And when we have done that and achieved that, then we can uh, add the secondary measures to receive uh, even lower emissions. And if we look at the primary measures that are on this stove, some of them are the same as Thomas mentioned, we have these uh, I'll just find my pointer here. We have the, I hope you can see that. That's not, I can see it better, I think. So there's the fuel part. And as a manufacturer, you don't really have an influence on what is the, what is the fuel that the, uh, the end user is using. Of course, you can advise them, but in any case, they can choose to do uh, something else. So this guideline will more focus on the 
primary emissions that we can actually control uh, as a manufacturer. So it means how are the combustion chamber uh, developed, the size and geometry and insulation, how the air is supplied or where it is supplied, what the fuel bed looks like. And then of course the control system, what you offer for the end client is a very important issue as well, how they can add the fuel, um, how big locks they can introduce into the combustion chamber, uh, how much air is coming into it, and probably also some combustion control systems like sensors and actuators and things like that to, to, give, a, to give the uh, an automated uh, system. Just briefly before I go on, I would like to introduce some terminology. Uh, so when I am talking about primary air, it's the air coming up through the grate or at least going directly into the fuel bed. The secondary air is coming from the backside of the wood stove and the window perch air is coming down uh, in front of this, uh, the, of the window pane or the window glass here uh, to clean the gas, but also to provide uh, extra air in the secondary combustion. And when we are talking about combustion chamber optimization, we need to have uh, 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 some, some words in our mind. So the three T's we could call them. So we have to make sure that there's turbulence and we have the residence time and we have the correct temperature. If one of these are missing, I think that Thomas said the same thing, then we will have much increased emissions. So we will have to really improve on the, all of these uh, different areas at the same time. And we have to have them in our mind when we are designing uh, wood stoves, at least when we are considering to do eco design or even better than the emissions for eco design. If we zoom in a little bit uh, on the temperatures, then what can we actually consider um, when we are talking about uh, to increase the temperature or at least to maintain them at an optimal level? Then of course, insulation is very important, um, but also the shape and the size of the combustion chamber. It really has to be fitted for the correct um, heat output that is wished for, for this uh, wood stove. And then of course, how the material of the door and the glass of the door and the glass on the door and the size of this glass will also contribute to the overall temperature of the, of the wood stove. <clears throat> and we can maybe even increase that by reducing the size of the glass or do using a coated glass or other uh, tricks, but it's very important that we maintain a optimal and high temperature. So in the next, you will also see me saying that <clears throat> maybe you should not introduce glass panes because it's not good for the combustion. I know it's nice for design. Then the time or the residence time, how long does the flue gas, how long the travel time does it have inside the combustion chamber? That will simply, the, the, the dispersion flame and the, the mixing between the oxygen and the flame area and the gas is very important. And we have to get, make that as long as possible for the combustion to be more complete. And of course the gas volume flow, and the distribution of the flue gas over the combustion chamber. Is there some kind of uh, path that it can go directly up or can we do something to get it to, um, to take another way in the combustion chamber and then have a longer way through it? And then of course the height of the combustion chamber. In, in recent years, we've seen a lot of very low uh, stoves. It means that the combustion air will just go quite fast out and then we'll reduce the resonance time and increase the emissions. Then we of course also need to consider the turbulence. This is also part of, you could say, increasing the resonance time, but making sure that we have a good, good uh, mixing between the flue gas and the oxygen entering the combustion chamber. So it will be a lot about how to distribute the window perch air, the direction and geometry of the air coming into the system and the velocities, uh, but also geometry of the main uh, as well as the post combustion chamber and also the system afterwards, the deflection plates. Um, then it's also very important that we avoid uh, leakage um, from different areas, false air coming in, disturbing the, the combustion and especially avoiding these short circuiting of, 
of the flue gas stream that it simply just goes directly up. So we need to really make sure that we have the flue gas, we have a proper mixing that we get it to swirl or we get it to turn around and have a long residence time. And we have a good mixture between the gases and the, um, of between the gases and the uh, oxygen. Then we have also seen in, in some of the studies that has been looked into to make this the technical guideline that these groove surfaces of, of, the, of the combustion chamber has uh, some kind of effect, at least in, in order to make sure that we don't have uh, small areas where there are no oxygen. Um, so, so that is also improving the, um, the, the combustion. So if we have to translate this into how should we make a, a combustion chamber if we want to achieve uh, low, um, low emissions, then we will start looking into the geometry of the combustion chamber, for example. So there's no doubt that with all the research being done over the last year, that high and slim geometry really improves, improves the flame dispersion and simply results in a more homogeneous pattern and you see a nicer flame picture. Um, and you simply see the better combustion. We, we also have seen these wide, uh, low uh, systems, and they simply do not uh, give very low emission results. Um, then one of the things that also really has to be considered is the dimension of the combustion chamber according to the uh, heat, heat output that is uh, needed for the wood stove. So, if it's a lower heat output stove, then the combustion chamber also needs to be smaller. And then you will have to make sure that the customer knows that the lock sizes also have to be smaller and also the other way around. Um, then if we want to achieve optimal results, then we should have really shouldn't have glass side panes. But if we need to do it uh, for designs, then we really need to make sure that they, they do not uh, re release so much heat. So we have to have some kind of radiation shielding or something like on them. Then the research has also shown that if you have a, 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 an angle of the glass or a, it's bent a little bit, then you actually see a bat, uh, uh, you see a lower um, a mixing of the air. Uh, then you have an area where there is, where there's no real, um, combination between the air and the gases. So, so really to try to reduce these angles of the glass and make it more flat, that will also improve the, uh, the combustion. Then the well isolated chamber and the stable high temperatures are also very important. And that's uh, some of the things that need to be considered when doing these uh, airtight door and system. And then these groove surface pattern to have this local turbulence as well. And that is especially if you want to reduce the elementary carbon emissions. Um, when you have had developed your stove, you could say that air staging is also extremely important. So the air staging inside the stove says should result in equally distributed fuel decomposition and that we can uh, have the charcoal burnout. Um, and the different airflows are uh, have uh, different types of jobs, you could say. Um, and but but in all cases, we have seen that it's important to have as little primary air as possible if you really want to reduce, especially um, black carbon emissions. We have seen that primary air is a really bad uh, component, so that has to be reduced uh, as much as possible. But also the window perch air, which can actually in some cases, you'll see it go down here and it will reach the fuel bed. It will also increase the, uh, the particle uh, emission and also the black carbon emission. So these has to be reduced as much as possible and then have more air coming into the secondary zone instead. Uh, but it's always a trade-off. Um, if you look at the different streams, then primary air should not be preheated whereas streams to secondary combustion uh, chambers should be preheated. And this is simply because if you have the heated um, air coming into here, we have a increased uh, uh, co emission of the, some of the in, in, uh, inorganic components in the fuel bed and they will be released. So by having a colder primary air, if you have to have a primary air, then the release will be smaller. Um, and then, yeah, it's very important that these uh, 
the air and the window perch air are dimensioned so that and also that the secondary nozzle and the placement of the secondary nozzle work so that they don't work as primary air because as I've said it will increase the um, increase the particle emission um, and then if possible secondary air should be applied in multiple levels so no, not just in one level as it has been done over the last years but in multiple levels then it will increase the uh, the emission reduction as well so one of the ways that we can look at this before we have built the stove and done a lot of testing is that we can introduce CFD um, as a tool for investigating how uh, the air flows are going into the stove. Uh, do we have a proper mixing? Um, and uh, will, will we see some kind of limitations in the system? So that's the way this tool works very well. I know there has also been done some research and, and been developed on the program so that you can also do emission uh, investigation via CFD, but I think that that is still very time consuming. So you'll get a quite a good result by simply looking into how are the uh, the flow patterns inside the combustion chamber and uh, do we simply have a good enough mixing of, of the air in from the different zones. And when we then consider that we have done these, we have optimized the, the three T's, we have uh, developed a better combustion chamber, we have, um, we have done everything that we can to ensure that the emissions are so uh, low as possible, then we have the user impact. And then as a manufacturer, you can also think a lot about how you could reduce the impact from the user. And that could be, for example, by using uh, the quick user guide that has been developed in, in the Be Real project, uh, quite simple on how to do it, uh, one page, but it actually works and gives good uh, knowledge about how to operate the wood stove as intended. The other way around is to look for automated control systems that can go instead of the uh, end user and take some of the responsibility away from, from them. The advantages of an automated control system is of course the reduced user, influ user influence, but also the reactions to the changes uh, throughout the batch, right? Wood stove combustion, combustion is, a, is a batch process with different uh, stages and optimal strategies are different for different part of the stages that are in, uh, in this system. Um, and what we also expect to see, and we have, I think we have also seen it, is that we especially see reducing the redu reduction of emissions in real life operations. We don't see it during testing, but in real life operation, we see lower emissions and we also see higher efficiencies. Um, in general, they can also increase this thermal efficiency, um, of course, also operation comfort, and then the standing losses when we are turning down the combustion then we can also reduce the, the air going through the system and we will do reduce the standing losses. If we look into the different types of automated control system, there's thermo uh, mechanically operated flaps, there's a electronic uh, sensor driven concepts, uh, working on different uh, methods. Uh, some are only measuring on the flue gas or some are measuring oxygens and things like that. And then there, of course, are also some stove uh, add-ons and retrofit systems that could be applied for one afterwards. But in general, it looks like it's the best way to use a system that's integrated from the start that gives the best result. To have an automated system, it's quite important to have some sensors available. Uh, the most robust, robust and this most uh, uh, the cheapest system you could say is uh, simply temperature sensors um, with, with thermocouples, but, but there are increasing uh, uh, amount of sensors available on the market. Um, oxygen, I think is the most robust, but then we have the other sensors are coming and we are being more and more able to introduce these into the systems. Um, they could also be pressure sensors and it could also be simply just to recognize in fly, flames or seeing if the door are open to give some kind of feedback to the user. Um, but in general, there is uh, still a lack of a system being able to work for uh, many years, I think, in, in the wood stoves. I think that for the oxygen sensors, it is possible. Um, and maybe there's also the cost issue that we have to consider. So now we have discussed all these primary measures that we can do to reduce the emissions. And if we don't have uh, any other possibilities, we have done everything we can, but we still see particle emissions or something like that. 
then we can consider these secondary measures. And I want to take long on this because Thomas already mentioned some of it, but we have these different type of secondary measures, catalyst or ESPs that can be used. Um, and the are, um, for if we look at the catalyst, then we mainly focus on the gas emissions. And of course, there will also be introduced uh, some issues by using catalyst. They can have flow resistance and everything that has to be considered as well. So it might reduce the CO, but it can introduce some other issues for the wood stove, or it will need some kind of me mechanical draft to overcome this. Um, if you look at the electrostatic precipitators, then we have uh, seen that they have quite uh, high efficiencies reached. I know that in Thomas's slides, there was a little bit lower, but we, I'm just talking about here what types of efficiency can be reached here. And that's both for PM and PN. Then we have also seen that there's a reduction potential for black carbon, it could be. Um, but when we are talking about precipitators, there's no uh, real effect with regards to uh, the CO or the hydrocarbons or the NOx. So there will have to be some kind of other measures to do that. Um, and gelatin supplying these are of course the, the cost of the filter itself, but also some of it could be where it's located and cleaning and things like that. But I know there's a lot of research are also going into this area to introduce this. But yeah, the, 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 the filters here have a real possibility of, of reducing the particle emissions quite a lot from, from wood combustion. If I'm to do some kind of summary, then when we are considering uh, the stove development phase, then we have to have in our mind, have these three T's, how we can improve the residence time of the flue gas, how we can improve the temperature inside the combustion chamber, and how can we make uh, turbulence inside the combustion zones in order to reach optimal combustion. And geometry of the combustion chamber is very, very important to reach uh, these uh, three T's. So really have to put a lot of uh, mind into how to optimize this geometry. And then the air, air supply and air staging is extremely important to reach the low emissions. Um, and then if possible, we should reduce the user influence on the combustion, use automated system, or at least give some kind of feedback to the user or giving them uh, good enough training in advance that they can reduce these emissions. The, the final report of these technical guidelines where you'll see all of this, you will see how a much more comprehensive uh, description of how to do it. And also you can see the research behind uh, these uh, guidelines. In this, uh, it, it will be published on the, on the Task 32 uh, IA Bioenergy website. And that will be in the next couple of months, I think. Um, so you can go in there and look at it. Um, that was all that I had to say, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Morten. That's very interesting, and we look forward to uh, the reporting. I think some editing is on my shoulders, uh, of course. Um, <clears throat> perhaps uh, you also had an option of uh, looking into the Q&A. Uh, and also in the, in the interest of, uh, of time to uh, see if we can respond to some of the yeah. questions there. Maybe I, I should do. maybe I should inform uh, the audience that if you have questions, you should put them in the Q and A uh, part, not in the in the chat, please. Um, thank you very much, Morten. We will move on quickly to the third presentation today. Uh, in this third pre presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel Reichert will explain how test methods uh, for wood stoves and pellet stoves uh, uh, to a higher extent than, uh, than they do now could represent real life operation, uh, operating conditions. Uh, Gabriel is a specialist in uh, uh, testing methods and he's employed as a senior researcher within emissions technology and research and disc gyric heating systems uh, in uh, the Austrian BEST Bioenergy and Sustainable Technologies. Gabriel is also a lecturer uh, and researcher uh, at the Department of Sustainable Energy and Systems uh, of, uh, and Bioeconomy at uh, the Fachhochschule uh, Wiener Neustadt in uh, Wieselberg in, uh, in Austria. And uh, 
Gabriel is uh, the main author of the report of real type test uh, real life test methods uh, for pellet stubs that uh, task 32 will uh, publish in, in the near future. So Gabriel, please go ahead. We're excited to hear your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. So um, as you could see it, my presentation is about real life test methods for logwood and for pellet stoves. And let's go into the details. So one question we could raise at the beginning, why we have to look at test methods or what is the purpose of test methods? Of course, they should guarantee the product quality, the product safety and the product reliability. And they should push technological development further. They should also reflect the truth and or in the best case, also the real life performance. And what could happen if test methods lose their reliability? I think it's quite nicely seen in this picture at the right side of the slide and all the those discussions we had in the car industry. So therefore, um, the objectives and the approach, so for firewood and for pellet stoves, as we already heard it today, the testing concepts shall become more real life relevant. And um, therefore the objectives are or were to compare the existing test methods worldwide, to evaluate the real life use of firewood and pellet stoves, and to identify the most relevant parameters for emission and efficiency performance. Um, also an objective is to evaluate the newly developed testing methods which focus on real life performance. So we have also heard already about that, the so-called be, be real test methods. And uh, another objective is to analyze the real life relevance of those newly developed uh, be real test methods by comparing the results in the lab and in the field and also comparing the results with the existing EN test standards results. So everything um, I present and also everything which you can find in the in the report uh, is based on literature review. And today I would like to focus on those three topics which you could see. Um, first, I would like to give you an overview of the surveyed uh, test standards. Second, I would like to introduce um, you a little bit those novel test concepts, the so-called be real firewood and pellet um, test concepts, and also a little bit the way um, how those test concepts were developed. And third, the third topic is um, to show you some uh, experimental test results and comparing lab results with field results. Um, as already mentioned, or um, the, I talked today about two reports, um, the part about the firewood stoves. Here the report is already available. So you can find this report um, by using the respective, respective link, which you could see. And as an outlook, uh, everything which I present about pellet stoves. So there will be also a, a report uh, available soon, which you could also find on the IEA bioenergy webpage. So let's have an overview of the surveyed um, test standards. So for firewood stoves, um, we reviewed quite some test standards and also for pellet stoves. I would not like to go uh, through those um, uh, test standards uh, step by step. What I would like to do, I would like to summarize a little bit what were the main findings and the main differences um, which came out of this survey. So for firewood stoves, uh, we saw that um, there is uh, that there are different testing approaches. So some test standards uh, test more or less under optimal conditions, but there are also some uh, test standards, for example, the US or the Canadian test standards, which taking into account some maloperating aspects. So for example, some different characteristics um, you can find in the in this list. So for fuel, for example, the type of fuel uh, might be differently. So some standards prefer hardwood, some softwood. Um, firewood is sometimes required, but also some test standards require uh, square timber. 
the batch mass is either defined by the manufacturers or um, defined by the combustion chamber volume. Um, testing is either done under controlled draft conditions as we are it, used to it, uh, for example, by the EN test standards or under natural draft conditions, which, is, uh, which are induced by a certain chimney high, for example. The number of tested load settings or the so-called uh, evaluated burn rates um, is differently. Important aspect is the PM sampling procedure. So typically we can differentiate between the hot sampling, which means uh, sampling in undiluted flue gas or the cold um, PM measurement, which means sampling in diluted flue gas. The thermal efficiency is either um, measured with the direct approach by using a calorimeter room or the indirect approach by evaluating uh, the losses. So for pellet stoves, um, the main findings and differences were um, the number of tested load settings, the number of required repetitions of measurements, um, the types of respected emissions and also the PM uh, measurement procedure. Um, in the following list, uh, we see also some examples for different characteristics. So preconditioning, for example, is quite important for some testing standards. So this means a certain amount of hours of operation of the stoves before testing is allowed. Um, the number of load settings um, is similar to the firewood stoves is differently PM sampling procedure. And one um, interesting aspect uh, I think is how uh, testing of appliances which are controlled by room thermostats uh, is handled or managed. So some standards require to switch off those um, controlling devices other uh, test standards um, have a certain uh, operation pattern to test those standard uh, to test those appliances in in this uh, configuration. So all the details uh, you can find uh, in the in the reports. Um, what I now would like to draw, I would like to come to to those uh, be real test methods. And um, when we want to test uh, with a focus on real life, then a, quite an important question is, okay, what are or what might be the main influencing factors on emission and thermal efficiency in real life operation? And for the firewood stoves, um, we categorized uh, those, uh, those uh, factors in, in three main categories. Of course, the technology is quite important as we had already heard a lot of things uh, in, the, in the previous presentations. Um, this is also the focus uh, which, uh, on which the EN test standards uh, focus. But the chimney is also quite important since uh, it induces the draft conditions. So it's quite important. And of course, this was also already mentioned a lot of times today, the user is quite important. So the user behavior um, can have uh, quite a serious influence on the real life performance. So at the beginning of this method development, a European user survey was conducted and also quite a comprehensive field monitoring, which means measuring, um, measuring stoves in the field, temperature and draft conditions. So I would not like to go into the details now, but the conclusion out of this survey and uh, field monitoring, uh, which we could draw is that realistic testing of firewood stove should include, of course, the ignition badge and the cooling down phase, since those phases uh, will occur every time in real life operation. And what was also observed is that not uh, always the same batch loads or the batch masses are used. So also some testing in nominal and part load uh, should be applied. Um, there were also uh, quite a number of experimental tests during, um, during the development process. So for example, the ignition technique as we heard it is quite important. So there were 
some comparative tests where top-down and bottom-up ignition technique were compared um, with different stoves. And the most relevant finding is that the optimal ignition technique should be specified by the manufacturer specifically for the respective appliances. The effect of draw conditions were also evaluated by experimental combustion tests. And here um, it was observed that um, the, the, the emissions might increase or decrease uh, with increased uh, draft conditions. No significant effect observed for PM emissions were observed in, the, in those um, tested uh, draft levels. But what was always seen um, is that higher draft conditions are linked with lower thermal efficiencies. The effect of the cooling down phase um, was also evaluated uh, exemplarily with a room heater. And um, what was observed is that the cooling down phase and especially the air settings can significantly affect the thermal efficiency. So based on all those um, results of the survey, field monitoring experiments in the lab, um, the, at, at the end, this be real test cycle was um, defined and suggested. And you see an, an, a scheme uh, of this uh, be real test approach for firewood stoves on that slide. So the test cycle, the be real test cycle includes eight consecutive batches. Um, with nominal load, which means 100% batch mass, and also uh, some batches in partial load, which means 50% of batch mass. And of course, uh, also a certain time of cooling down is respected in, the, uh, in this test approach. Um, the procedure or the operation mode during testing uh, is specified by an obligatory quick user guide, which was already presented by, by Martin. So the principle of this quick user guide is that the operation is illustrated with text and with pic pictures. And the, uh, the, this quick user guide should be not only used during testing, so it should be also the basis for the end customers later in the field for a best practice heating operation. We already heard a lot of some uh, about official type test results. Uh, on this slide, I also would like to present some official type test results for different firewood room heating appliances, cookers, room heaters, insets, low heat release appliances. So um, when we compare all those, uh, those numbers and data, then we can see, OK, the the results, the official type test results are quite similar um, between the single technologies. Here a differentiation between conventional and modern technologies um, was, was made, but this refers mainly to the thermal efficiency um, performance. When we compare those uh, official type test results with the future eco design emission limit values, which will come into force in 2020, 20, uh, then we can see that those, um, uh, those emission limit values are already met for carbon monoxide and the volatile organic compounds, um, but not achieved for the particular meta emissions. Finally, at the end of this Be Real project, um, there was an evaluation of the real life relevance, and I think this is quite important. So. Um, how was this done? So in, in some 13 serial uh, uh, production appliances were used for comprehensive tests, not only in the lab, but also in the field, the same appliances. So in the lab, um, there, were, there were two test modes performed. So the official type test, uh, official type test was repeated by the different research institutes and the B-Real test cycle was conducted. After those tests, the same appliances were installed in the field at different uh, end users. And there were um, conducted three test days, one test day. At one test day, um, the operation was done according to the user's own habits. 
second test day, uh, um, uh, the operation was done according to the quick user guide and the third test day, um, the be real test cycle was conducted. And of course we can compare those results with the official type test results, not of the same stove, but of the same stove models, which were used. And those um, results of this measurement campaign, you can see on this slide. So in the first column, you see the official type test results. In the second column, you see the repeated type test results by the different research institutes. Then we have the results of Be Real in the lab, Be Real in the field, and the two user days. And what we can see is that there is quite that there are quite significant differences between the test results uh, the, of the repeated type tests and the official type tests. If we compare the official type tests with the field, um, the field days, so to say, then we see that official type test results are quite far away from field performance, the same as Thomas mentioned in his presentation before. Um, when we compare the be real um, the be real test results in the lab with the be real test results in the field and also with those user days, then we see that there is quite a good um, real life relevance uh, for the emissions. So for the emissions, but for thermal efficiency, for example, we see that we have higher uh, efficiencies in the lab for be real compared to the field. So the reason for that um, is most are most probably the increased draft conditions in the field compared to those 12 Pascal, which are also applied during the real testing. So this was uh, in, a, in a very fast run, um, the most relevant results about the firewood stoves. Um, now let's continue with the topic about pellet stoves. So also here, if you want uh, to have a realistic testing, then it's quite important to know what are the main influencing factors on emissions and thermal efficiency in real life. And we categorized um, those uh, factors in also in three categories. So technology is quite important. Uh, also here, this is the focus of the European test standard, but the fuel, as we will see it, um, the fuel is quite important and is here mentioned as a single, um, as a single aspect. And of course, the operating conditions in real life are, are uh, important for efficiency and also the emissions. Um, pellet stoves were also included uh, in the European user survey and the field monitoring. So the user survey showed that um, pellet stoves are typically used as a secondary heating system and they are very often not uh, or predominantly operated at a reduced power level. So this was also observed during field monitoring. So Based on that, um, a conclusion was that realistic testing of pellet stove should, of course, um, include different load settings, load changes, but also cold and warm starts since starting, several starting uh, were uh, typical, uh, were also quite uh, typical in, in the field, seen in the field monitoring. Um, the experiments, there were also quite a number of experiments or experimental tests during the, um, during the method development uh, time. So for example, it was evaluated what is the effect of the cleaning interval. So the cleaning interval um, typically increase the emissions and reduces thermal efficiency. Um, the fuel is seems to be quite uh, relevant. So experimental tests in one stove, I think this should be mentioned, um, caused very large emission varia variations when different pellets were used. Um, all of those pellet samples were uh, certified, EN plus certified. There's also one interesting study uh, dealing with the with a potential effect of the length distributions of pellets on the emissions. So it was also observed that the length distribution might be um, important um, for emissions. And uh, there's just an, a, a few examples of, of experiments which, which were uh, respected for this be real 
um, be real pellets. And here on that slide, I would like to show you just the scheme and the most relevant aspects for this be, the be, develop be real uh, test cycle. So um, preconditioning is requested. So this means that before be real testing, the stove has to be operated at least six hours. The be real test cycle lasts around 7.5 hours and includes three phases. So phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, and as you can see, uh, it includes different load settings with uh, one cold start, one um, load changes. We have two warm starts. Uh, we have in, in this phase one, the load change from nominal load to low load. Of course, we have the two standby phases. The cleaning intervals um, are not allowed to be switched off during testing, so they are included in the testing process and of course also in the um, data evaluation. On this slide you see um, just the, the, you see also official type test results, um, not only for the firewood stove, so this I have already presented. In the last two columns you see the results uh, of the study which uh, were available for the pellet stoves. So when we compare pellet stoves with firewood stove, in general speaking, we see that the pellet stoves show a better performance regarding emissions and also efficiency. When we compare the, um, the test results with the future eco-design emission limit values, then the picture is quite similar. Um, they are already met, uh, met for carbon monoxide and the volatile organic compounds. They are not achieved for the particular matter emissions. Also, um, the be real test method for pellet stoves was evaluated regarding the real life relevance. So the approach was nearly the same as already presented for the firewood stoves. So fear serial production appliances were used. Um, the, the official type test at nominal load, only at nominal load was repeated by the different research institutes. Um, we had the be real test cycle in the lab and also in the field and we have, uh, there were two uh, user days um, in the field. So one day the user operated uh, the stoves according to their own habits using their own fuel. Second day only the fuel was differently. So it was the same fuel as, as used in the previous lab test by the different RTD institutes. Here we have a summary of all the results out of this uh, measurement campaign. So um, we have here in the first two columns, uh, once again, the results of the SHIDA study. Um, in the third column, we see the official type test results, nominal load. Um, then we have the repeated type test results for the same stoves, uh, for the respective stoves. And then we have be real in the lab be real in the field and the both user days. So the last three columns refer to field and in other columns refer to lab testing. So when we compare the RTD type tests with the official type test results, then we see that the emissions um, for carbon monoxide and PM were quite higher um, throughout those repeated type tests and the thermal efficiency quite lower. When we compare uh, the emissions of field performance, um, the emissions of field performance with the official type test results, then we also see that there is a great, great uh, deviations. So 300% higher carbon monoxide, 100% higher particular matter emissions. Interestingly, the volatile organic compounds were quite low. Um, the thermal efficiency in real life was around uh, 85%. And when we compare the be real test results with the, uh, with in the lab and in the field, and also the be real test results with the both user days, then we see that this is quite, that we, that there was quite a good agreement. But also very interesting is to look only at those last two columns, because here, 
um, the user operated the stoves and only the fuel was differently. So also here we have this so-called fuel impact. I will come to this aspect um, in the in the conclusion. So there might be there might be some uh, fuel impact, which is quite uh, relevant. So to sum up and to conclude, so some general uh, findings. Um, there are uh, differences of the different test concepts, but uh, in generally speaking, it seems that international standardization might be feasible, at least in a long-term perspective, and it would strongly support industry. When we compare lab and field test results, then we see this um, the higher emission and the lower thermal efficiency in the field um, compared to the official type test results, as it was several times mentioned today. Important factors on real life operation are the load settings and the transient phases. So advanced test methods should of course include those phases like ignition, load changes, uh, cleaning intervals and so on. Um, to be realistic on the one hand, but also to push technological development in the right direction on the other hand. Specifically for firewood stoves, um, it is important to be aware of this big user influence. So the user should be guided towards best practice use. Um, the technological development, of course, should focus on the user and the real life operation. For pellets, it was observed that the fuel might have a significant influence on the emissions, even when only certified pellets are used. So we think that this aspect of course needs further research. There might be some uh, still not known fuel parameters or some technology restrictions which cause such variations, but I think there is further research necessary. Um, you find all the references of this presentation for those of you who are interested to go into details. And finally, I would like to Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, it's important work. Uh, it seems uh, to make sure that the, that the, the consumer gets what uh, he or she expects. Um, also in stoves and pellet stoves. <clears throat> so, uh, this was the last uh, uh, presentation, and as you probably have seen, we are getting pretty close to the end of the webinar uh, initial timing. I think there has been an effort uh, by uh, Thomas and Morten to respond to uh, questions along the way. And uh, I think since we have a, a couple of minutes left, uh, I will stick with just asking these three speakers uh, for the main main recommendations, um, uh, given what you have heard and what uh, what your own presentations were, uh, Thomas, are you there? Maybe you could start. Yes, thank you. Um, Moving forward, what would be your recommendation? Well, stoves. I summarized my recommendations, but now after the discussion, I can conclude that there was a really great interest. So thank you for the many questions. And I tried to uh, answer them all uh, during the other presentations. And uh, one question which was also um, asked and which is maybe still open is uh, also, which are the opportunities for further wood stove improvements by also computation fluid dynamics. Um, I did not talk about this. I personally believe that CFD modeling is a very nice and powerful tool. And it may help to optimize, for instance, the geometry and um, air distribution in combustion chambers, etc. So it is a very helpful tool. Maybe just also as an additional comment, when it comes to wood stoves and also log wood boilers, I think the challenging situation is still that we have a batch process. So start up from cold, 
non-stationary process, um, I am convinced that CFD does help to improve air injections, things like that. But um, applying CFD for really doing a final design of a wood stove, I think this is highly challenging. So I think uh, it will always still need both experimental and just to a certain to a certain extent trial and error by building a prototype and see how it works and optimization yes we can do a lot so we have also been doing a lot of um, <clears throat> cfd optimization in automatic boilers but also we did look at the uh, design of wood stoves and we even also did apply or do apply some laser measurements in, on scaled model from um, um, transparent models to, to a certain extent validate the CFT. So this was just also one question. And it was the question which type will we work with um, ANSYS, Fluent, or um, earlier we had other tools, but currently I think we last uh, calculations we performed with the sciences. Thank you, Thomas. Mo, do you have a final comment or recommendation? I think oh, it, especially I th it, it was interesting uh, that you don't recommend glass and I can see that many manufacturers <laughs> actually go, go, go uh, transparent. Yeah. yeah, no, it, of course, it's just, it, it's just when we're talking about optimization of the combustion, it's not the best way, right? But I know also manufacturers of glass are working quite a lot on how to reduce the radiation from the glass, right? So, yeah, so probably it's possible, right? But you have to consider it at least. And I think that one of the main things that I wanted to say was that we have to take balanced decisions, right? We, that we know when we are choosing something that we have chosen something else off, we have that we, and then we can't do that. And then I also think that a very important thing that we have to bear in mind is how we can reduce the user impact here. Because as we saw, I think both from Thomas and from Gabriel, that the automated systems from, from boilers, they have really reduced the, uh, the, uh, the emissions quite a lot, right? And then we have this uh, batch type of operation and can we reduce that by, by introducing some kind of automated systems and helping, or at least just giving the feed some kind of feedback to the end user. I think that would be of very great importance so that they can do better because I think they actually want to do better. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, Gabriel, do you have a, a final comment? Now we, we just heard your presentation, of course, but uh, anything to add? Um, yes, I agree totally with um, Thomas and also Morten. I also think that's important to take into account the users since they, especially for stoves, I would say, regarding the test methods, um, I think development and testing should go hand in hand. So it, it, it's important to have both uh, focus on development uh, process and also the test procedures. And now it's, uh, yeah, I think it's time to, to, to bring, for the test methods to bring them into life and to, to use them. Um, there are, there were some, some steps already done by this blue angel quality label, where I think many things of the BeReal project were respected and already implemented. Um, but yeah, I think could be, some there are some things to do in the future thank you very much and i think i'm afraid we will we'll have to to end here uh, i can see that there are some uh, questions that uh, have not been uh, uh, had uh, perhaps a, a direct answer uh, if you wish you don't have uh, you have a, an important question uh, i'm quite sure that uh, that the speakers uh, uh, will be ready to respond to those if you contact them directly. I wish to thank you all three very much uh, for sharing uh, information. And I also want to thank the, uh, all, of, all of you attendees uh, for being part of this uh, event. Uh, I hope you feel informed a little bit and then you might have gained some insights that, uh, that can be helpful in your, in your respective future work and thinking. Uh, thank you all.
also to the ETA for organizing the practical part of the, the webinar. And uh, thank you and uh, goodbye for now. Hope to see you in a, at a later stage, another webinar or uh, again. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody.